is up, you guys, and welcome finally to Halloween. If you had any idea by the smile on my face how excited I am to start this spooky week with you guys. I've put so much work and effort into this to bring you guys an amazing, amazing week of videos. So I hope you enjoy. I hope there is something in this week that is for everyone. And I am starting with my personal pick of a first video that has absolutely blown my mind. And that is the mysterious death of Charles C. Morgan. This has been a case that I've actually been looking into and I almost added last year in Halloween and I finally can't wait any longer. So Charles Morgan was a 39 year old husband and father of four living in Tucson, Arizona. He adored his wife, Ruth, and his four daughters and worked hard as an escrow agent to provide for them. Now, if you don't know what an escrow agent is, it's basically the person who handles and holds property while a transaction is being finalized. They hold all the papers, you know, everything important is with them. They're kind of like this outside third party between the buyer and the seller. His life seemed entirely normal and average. Even when you look at a picture of him, he looks like your typical dad, but something so bizarre happened that everyone questions to this day day. My husband has even been looking up some of the craziest things in regards to this case, trying to decipher meanings and the small bits of information. On March 22nd, 1977, Charles was on his way to work when he mysteriously disappeared. Now, I have no idea if his family reported him missing. I am assuming they did. Unfortunately, the nitty gritty initial details of this case aren't available in many places. I tried looking it was unsuccessful, but I do know he never made it to work that day and he had never said to anyone that he had any other plans other than his typical daily routine. His family was shocked and they never saw this coming. He never would have left intentionally. He was a family man, so they obviously feared the absolute worst. That is until about three days later when he burst through the door with no warning, I believe in the dead middle of the night. When he walked in, Ruth was obviously overjoyed that he was home, but she quickly went from overjoyed to horrified. Charles was missing a shoe. He had handcuffs on his wrists and his ankles, and he wouldn't speak. He seemed absolutely frantic. He began to search through all of the doors in their home when Ruth finally, I think, put two and two together and realized he was trying to find a piece of paper and a pen. So she grabbed one and handed them to him and he started to scribble something down that seemed absolutely insane. Charles wrote down that he had been kidnapped, tortured, and forcibly given a drug in his throat that made it so he couldn't speak because it could potentially destroy his entire nervous system. Ruth threw every question in the books at Charles to try to figure out who had taken him, what they wanted, why they targeted him, were they still in danger, but Charles refused to pretty much say anything at all. He referred to his kidnappers and captors as them and mentioned briefly that he had been somewhere near the Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix, which if you're not aware, there's a lot of conspiracies about that airport. She attempted to get him to call police and report this situation, thinking, you know, something needed to be done, but this sent Charles off the deep end. He flipped out, said he absolutely could not call authorities, and they couldn't tell anyone about this because if they did, his whole family would be killed. Now, life from here continued on as normal, or at least as normal as it can be after you've been kidnapped, tortured, and given a hallucinogenic drug that could destroy your nervous system. Charles just went back to work. He continued on his life, but he was so obviously paranoid and it just progressively got worse as time passed. His daughters were not allowed outside alone. He pre-arranged rides for them to and from school so that they were never in a position where they had to walk alone, which would make them vulnerable or get in the car with someone unexpected that he didn't trust, which again, he believed would make them vulnerable. I have seen that he even tried to change up his physical appearance a little bit, almost to disguise himself. It seemed almost like he was just waiting for something else to happen, which made the entire family uneasy. 
Charles then went to Ruth one day and told her that he had something to confess. And she, I'm sure, was thinking there's no telling what this could be given the circumstances of his first disappearance. But he said something that I don't think she was expecting and a lot of you guys are going to be very confused by. He told her that he was not just working as an escrow agent at his office. I believed he owned this business. Uh, don't quote me on that. That's just kind of what I've taken from this. But he said he also worked at the Treasury Department. He said he had worked for them for about two or three years and that his captors had actually taken his Treasury ID so he couldn't show it to her to prove it. Now... I know that doesn't seem like the craziest secret to hide, but like, oh dang, I have a secret. I work for the treasury department, but it actually at the time meant something a bit different potentially to work for the treasury or under the treasury department. I don't know if you guys are aware, but at this time period, the secret service was actually under the treasury department. It was not under the Department of Homeland Security like it is today. And it meant something almost in entirely different-ish. They basically started at the Treasury and Secret Service to help stop counterfeiting and to provide security for our money, basically. They just protected our money under the Treasury Department. Um, so he either could have meant that in a sense of he was just working with the Treasury Department because they deal with our money as an escrow agent. He was used to dealing with money. That would make sense. Or it could have meant he was technically working for the Treasury Department, but for the Secret Service. And since he told her this was this huge secret he needed to confess, the latter seemed most likely. But still, he wouldn't go into much detail about why it was such a big deal and why after his kidnapping, he suddenly felt the need to tell this to Ruth. And unfortunately, Ruth will never get the answers because two months after his initial disappearance, Charles disappeared again. Charles had left for work that morning. Again, it seemed like a routine day. Ruth left to take all of their children to school. He was supposed to go to his office to work his day job, and then he was going to a Masonic meeting that night, which is another thing that's caused a whole bunch of conspiracies within this, particularly ones that my husband like cannot stop thinking about now. So he had plans for the day. He had a set list of to-dos, and there was no reason for anyone to believe that he ran off. He even called into work that day from a downtown payphone saying that he would be there in about 30 minutes. I'm assuming maybe he was late and he just wanted to let them know, but he never showed up. Charles was reported again, I think as a missing person, but I have no idea if any searches were done, if they were, how extensive they were. Then nine days after Charles went missing, something bizarre happened. Ruth received a phone call to their home and it was a female caller and she referred to herself as Green Eyes. Now, all she said to Ruth was, Chuck is all right and everything will be all right. She then said Ecclesiastes 12, one through eight from the Bible. Ruth had absolutely no idea who this woman was. She'd never heard of someone named Green Eyes before and she had no idea why this person would have said, Chuck is all right, which was Charles' nickname. I um, didn't really specify that before. Um, or why this person would, you know, say this specific part of the Bible. And after she read this part, it still didn't make sense. So I'm going to read it to you guys so you can kind of understand. Obviously, there's multiple different versions. This is just the King James version. It says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds returned after the rain. And the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few and those that look out of the windows be darkened and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because men goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. 
Now, I personally don't understand how this could correlate, but again, I will let you guys let me know what you think down below. And Ruth agreed that she didn't know how on earth this could have possibly had any sort of relation to Charles and his disappearance. Ruth and his family hoped that he would just pop back in like the first time that he disappeared, but unfortunately, that is not what happened. Days after the call from Green Eyes on June 18th, 1977, Charles' body was found alongside a dirt road and his car 40 miles away from his home in a place called Cells. When authorities searched his body and his surroundings, some of the strangest things were found. Charles had died from a bullet wound in the very back of his head, and the gun that was used was his own 357 revolver. The gun itself was located near his body, and he had only been dead at this point for approximately 12 hours. But Charles was also wearing a bulletproof vest, which is not something you would expect to see on someone, just your everyday outings. He was also wearing a holster and he had a knife on him. But that's not even the strangest information. Pinned to his underwear was a map in his own handwriting that showed directions to the location where his body was found. There was also a second map that led to Robles Junction and Salas City, which are two towns nearby that at the time were pretty much only known for smuggling. Along with the two maps was a $2 bill that had seven Spanish surnames on it, along with Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through Eight. the same citation that Green Eyes had told to Ruth over the phone. And all of these things were pinned to his underwear. When they checked the car itself, it was filled with multiple guns, a lot of ammunition, there were handcuffs, there was also a pair of sunglasses and a tissue with a tooth wrapped up in it. It was also found that the car had been modified so it could be unlocked from the fender. Then two days after his body was found, while this was an ongoing investigation, Green Eyes ended up calling the investigating authorities at Pimo County to tell them what she knew. She claimed to have seen Charles after he disappeared, but before he died. She said that they met at a motel. I don't know what motel. I've seen a handful of locations stated to be the hotel they met at, but I have not been able to confirm really any of them. Um, but she said that Charles had a briefcase on him that was just stacked full of cash. He told her that he was planning on paying off a hitman that was after him. So according to Charles, there was a $90,000 contract out for his life that was increasing by $5,000 a day. He told Green Eyes that he hoped to buy this hitman off, pay him more money than he had been offered, so hopefully he could return back to his normal life. But Green Eyes, from what I've seen, didn't explain much more to authorities at all. This is pretty much all she had to say. Now, authorities were obviously not sure whether to believe her or not. They knew that someone named Green Eyes had already called Ruth, and then this person had called, you know, their office. But there are just kind of people out there that attach themselves onto cases and just create this scenario in their head for their own entertainment. So they decided to try to corroborate this, and sure enough, they were able to corroborate her story through CCTV footage at the motel she stated she was at. Now, I don't know how they corroborated it. I don't know if it just showed that he was there um, and maybe that he met with someone, but if they saw this female in the footage, all I know is that they were not able to identify her. But she clearly had some type of connection to Charles and what happened to him because, you know, he had written the same exact Bible citation on this $2 bill. It was in his handwriting from what I've seen. And this is the same Bible citation told to Ruth. You know, I understand, it. again, it could be easy to look up the family phone number. This could have been a scam. But again, she knew information about someone meeting Charles. Maybe she was just a random acquaintance that he trusted. I know authorities spoke to Ruth and asked if he was maybe having an affair. She said there was absolutely no way. Um, I still believe there's a possibility. We never know what people are capable of. Um, but, you know, again, it could have just been an acquaintance that he trusted. Maybe it was an associate. Maybe someone he worked with in the Secret Service or Treasury Department or wherever he was secretly working. Maybe he told her to call Ruth to ease her mind because it seems like he honestly 
believed he could pay off this hitman, you know, in order to go back to his family. Maybe he didn't want her to worry. He had figured everything out and said, you know, call her, calm her down. I have absolutely no idea where she comes in. When forensics were done on all of the items at the crime scene, it just makes things that much more confusing. The gun from the crime scene, the one that was used to shoot Charles in the back of the head, had no fingerprints on it at all. So this means the gun was either wiped clean or whoever used it wore gloves. As a matter of fact, there weren't just no fingerprints on the gun. They couldn't find any fingerprints at all at the entire crime scene. The car, sunglasses, everything. Nothing had fingerprints on it. The sunglasses in the car were determined to not belong to Charles. I'm not quite sure how they determined that, but they did find out that the tooth that was wrapped up in the tissue was Charles. But why would he have pulled a tooth out and then kept it with him wrapped in a tissue? This is when more conspiracy theories start. Authorities were waiting for the full autopsy report in order to finalize evidence while they were trying to figure out what exactly happened to Charles. But it seemed like someone else was either trying to cover up their tracks or get rid of that evidence because while in the police department's lot, like the lot where they keep all the cars they have taken, Charles' car was broken into and just torn through. At the same time, his office for his escrow business was completely ransacked. And as if that's not terrifying and suspicious, two FBI agents showed up at the family home, quickly flashed their badge to the point where Ruth couldn't even check if they were actually FBI agents. They pushed their way in and they destroyed the home. They tore it two bits looking for something. They never ever told Ruth what they were looking for, never asked her help for what they were looking for. They came in, tore the house apart and disappeared. At this point, Charles' family knew something was obviously not right, but authorities begged to differ because on August 10th, 1977, Charles' death was ruled a suicide. Now, this doesn't seem right for multiple reasons. First of all, he was shot in the back of the head. That is not something you typically see when it comes to a suicide. That's a very awkward angle to kind of put your arm and your hand. Uh, but to top it off, gunshot residue was found on his left hand. He was right-handed, which means he would have been holding the gun in his left hand, which makes the awkward position even more awkward and unlikely. Along with that, the gun had no fingerprints. He wasn't wearing gloves at the time that they found him that I've seen, which means he would have left fingerprints, which means he would have had to wipe them off. And I highly doubt that is something that he did after shooting himself in the head. Also, why would someone that wants to end their life be wearing a bulletproof vest? So basically the logistics are all off. It didn't make any sense. It didn't match any of the rest of the story that they were kind of able to corroborate but that's how they called it and they moved on. And keep in mind too, this was only open for, you know, around a month or maybe two months. He, his body was found June 18th, yeah, two months. And August 10th was when it was deemed a suicide. Now people started coming forward at this point because they also knew something was not right. His attorney, Ronald Newman came forward saying that there was a possible reason someone might target him. And it was the first of many. Charles had just recently testified in a secret investigation regarding a Mexican American bank in Arizona that was being looked into by federal and state officials. Now, the bank had been created for equal opportunities for minorities who were struggling to get loans from typical banks of any kind, uh, more specifically securing houses, which again, could tie into what exactly Charles did at his escrow job. Um, but basically, this bank was created shortly before his death. But the bank kind of was not doing great from the get-go. Um, they had very few big investors. So they essentially relied on selling their shares door to door for small amounts to have enough money for the bank to even give anyone a loan or to start up. So many people ended up being involved in this and having a say, and it created a lot of angry shareholders. People didn't get along. You know, the many members on the board itself didn't get along. So many lawsuits happened from shareholders. Um, Bank of America actually forced them to change their name at one point. 
Um, and then finally, around the time that Charles was murdered, state officials and federal officials, as I said before, started looking into the bank for insider loans and unsound practices. And I'm not exactly sure what unsound practices means, um, but when it comes to money, <laughs> There probably can be many different explanations, but apparently Charles knew about some of the dealings that the bank was involved in in relation to this investigation. So that obviously puts him in a very vulnerable situation. He is testifying against an entire bank. You know, these are people that are minorities and they are already mad they're being oppressed and pushed down and not treated fairly. And then this white man goes and, you know, leaks all their secrets. I mean, I can see where the anger would happen here. But there were also even more rumors that Charles was potentially working for two gigantic organized crime families, you guys. I can't, I can't make this up. One family in specific was actually known for land fraud, which again ties into what he did as an escrow agent. Now, there are so many theories in this case. It's just endless on the internet. We all know people love a conspiracy theory and there's so many bizarre bits of information in this that I can totally see that. But kind of the more tangible things from the facts that we have, obviously we have the ruling that his death was a suicide. But to me, that just doesn't add up. Granted, we don't have all of the evidence. Authorities had that. We also aren't professionals. We're just here with the basics. But from those basics and my own common sense, one plus one does not equal two here. But I can see it from an angle of maybe he was so paranoid and stressed out about whatever had happened. There are some people that believe he suffered from some type of mental disorder that caused him to end his own life. I can definitely see it from that perspective, but again, just given the you know, circumstances of the crime scene, don't know if I'm really sold on that. The next theory is that some people believe that his escrow business was basically just a money laundering scheme. Uh, Arizona at the time was the only state that allowed blind trusts. And the amount of information I read to even figure out what the heck that meant makes my head hurt just thinking about it. Um, but the very basics of it, and it can be different from this, it just depends on the situation. But essentially, it means that someone puts their money into a trust, but has pretty much no control over it and is not allowed to see it. So basically the trustee is put in charge of all of the money and they don't go, you know, to the person who owns the trust and say, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to buy this? Do you want me to do this? They make all of the, the decisions and purchases on their own. However, a lot of people believe that this is also a great setup when it comes to laundering money. So if he is getting you know, all of this business with his escrow company, he's this third party in charge of the money. You know, there's just so many ways this can all tie in together. He could be putting bits into the trust and there's just so many different theories on how that could play out. Now, another big theory is that he, again, was working for the treasury as a secret agent and his workings ended up landing him as a target to some very dangerous people which again, I can see, and given the fact that he was apparently taken, had his ID taken from him and was given the hallucinogenic drugs, I can see that. And then if you look even deeper into the airport, even more people believe that's true. Honestly, at this point, given all the information we have, I can almost see all of that as plausible, which sounds insane for me to say, but I feel like this world's crazy, so there's no telling. In 1990, more information ended up coming out. On February 7th of that year, Unsolved Mysteries actually aired a show covering his death and it resulted in a flood of tips. A ton of tips came in. The journalist involved in covering this case followed these different leads and he was able to find out a lot of information. Now, he stated it as if he was able to confirm all of this. I have no idea if that's true. Um, I don't know how he confirmed any of it, but I'm going to tell you what he said he confirmed. One thing is that he found out Charles was possibly involved in a money laundering scheme, which is something we already kind of spoke about, plus transactions in gold and platinum between 1973 and 1977 when he died. Again, I have no idea what evidence they have to prove this or what lead you know, suggested this, how they deemed it as plausible, but it's out there. And this is one of the things they said they uncovered. Now, another tip came in that pointed out that CIA agents and possibly 
uh, the Vietnamese government were somehow involved in his murder. Now, I have zero idea how the Vietnamese government could possibly connect to this. I tried to do a little bit of digging. I do know that they are considered to be in the major leagues, so to speak, when it comes to gold consumption. So maybe that kind of ties in to the money laundering and the gold transactions and the platinum transactions. And then, you know, maybe he was paying the CIA agents to allow him to do this. Um, there's no telling. It's scary to think about, honestly. Now, another tip came in that said, again, there was another potential money laundering scheme linked to real estate. He's an escrow agent. That makes sense. That's something people had really already talked about. But apparently, the one thing they found out is that he kept copies of all of the illegal transactions that were made in relation to this money laundering scheme. Now, some people believe that this is why the FBI showed up to the family's house and ransacked the entire place. People believe that's why his car was destroyed, his office was destroyed, because these people were looking for evidence so that they could destroy it. These... Um, copies of the transactions in particular. Now, then things get a little bit scary because nothing more was really proven, but a lot of people started to dig really, really deep into this case and there's potentially a connected crime. So after the episode aired, just months later, a man from Phoenix left his job at a computer company and he was found dead in his car an hour later. He had been shot around his left ear from I think what they concluded to be at least 12 inches away. The death was somehow ruled a suicide, which didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but apparently the journalist that dug super deep for Unsolved Mysteries lived across the street and drove a very similar car. So a lot of people strongly believe that this was supposed to be a hit on the journalist uncovering all these leads and following all these leads, but they got the wrong guy. Now, there's apparently been quite a few other people that have dug too deep into this case and followed leads that have mysteriously died, but nothing has really been proven. Um, but that's absolutely terrifying. And at this point, they're really no closer to figuring out what actually happened. And from what I've seen, authorities still are just deeming it a suicide and case is closed. The only people that are even still attempting to figure it out are just outsiders that see how absolutely bizarre this story is. So I'm very interested to see what you guys think down below. A lot of people don't think there will ever be answers because this was something so perfectly covered up. I mean, he was a Freemason, that already can get you into some trouble. Potentially working with crime family organizations, potentially working with the CIA, a foreign government, money laundering, you know, he's tied up with a bank that's known for inside loans and unsound practices. There's no telling what that means. It just seems like a lot of money, a lot of property, and a lot of illegal transactions are all involved in this case. And I highly doubt there is much of a trail on those. So I'm actually very interested to see if any of you guys really are on board with how the case was ruled. That this is something that, you know, was simply him ending his life. There's not a lot of people online that really even entertain that idea, but there is such a huge possibility that he potentially was just struggling from some sort of mental breakdown or mental disorder that, you know, maybe caused him to believe some of this stuff was real when it wasn't. But at the same time, there's this like conspiracy theorist in me that's like, that's what they would want you to believe. So I'm very interested to see what you guys have to say. I feel like I cannot possibly make a decision on what I think is most plausible here. Um, so I can't wait to see what your theories are down below. I hope you enjoyed this day of Halloween. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow for another video. And yeah, so hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. I'm posting videos all week this week leading up to Halloween. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye.